If you have a copy of God's Word, Matthew 26, Matthew chapter 26. And uh, we're going to start where we were last week, reading, but we'll end up a little further down the road. Uh, I'll be glad when spring comes. Amen? The sun shines. It's coming, though. You know what I mean? It won't be long. The Lord will have it all. He'll be smiling. He's already smiling. And we need this rain. Amen? We need it for the flowers and the gardens and all those other great, wonderful things the Lord's created. If you have your Bible... This morning, Matthew chapter 26, last week we read and started and read in verse 36. We're going to start reading there and we'll, our reading will be a little lengthy uh, this morning. Verse 36 of Matthew 26, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, fell on his face, and prayed, and saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time. And prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass, uh, uh, pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he, then cometh he to the disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, and let us be going. Behold, he that is, uh, he that is at hand, that he, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves uh, from the chief priest and the, and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and said, excuse me, then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the, a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put again thy sword in this place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Watch this. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? And in the same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves uh, to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Father, we love you today. Lord, thank you for your kindness and your goodness to us. And 
I pray now as we look into the Bible, you would remind us, help us to be mindful of Gethsemane. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to take us there to the spot. And Lord, help us to see uh, the uh, great things that were filled in Scripture that day. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to uh, glean some things from the Word of God. We'll love you for it. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord is in Gethsemane. If you recall, last week we talked about being very uh, sorrowful, even unto death, and very heavy. <coughs> and we placed, uh, preached on the placement of sin well, while the Lord's there, uh, not only is the placement of sin going to be placed upon him, the Lord's going to place sin on him, uh, but betrayal uh, walks right into the garden with him. Uh, the Bible said he loved Judas. He loved Judas just like he loved the rest of the disciples. And uh, Judas is going to betray the Lord and uh, with a kiss. He, Later on in the scriptures, you'll see a place where it says, Betrayest thou thy friend with a kiss? And Judas had let it be known that when he come into the garden, the one that he would kiss was one that they needed to take hold on. Now, as the Lord is there, he begins to reveal to the other disciples that he's going to be betrayed. And the second that he begins to talk, Judas comes before with a multitude of people. And the Lord asks a question here, he's kind of a little bit of, if you will, uh, I wouldn't say sarcastic, but a, a little bit of putting them in their place. Why are you bringing so many people to take me? I'm one man. I mean, they're bringing a bundle of people, multitude of servants that are coming to take the Lord. Why would they have to take that many people to, to, to bring him into custody when there was only a few there in the garden with him? And uh, as it comes to pass, you see Peter, here Peter is again. He's going to stand up and he smile. He cuts one of the high priest servant's ear off. You'll find out later that the Lord, right as Peter takes this man's ear off, the Lord miraculously does a miracle and heals this man's ear. Somebody said, Preacher, why does the scriptures uh, record such an uh, incident? Why would God allow that to uh, be recorded in the Word of God? Well, sometimes even the righteous can cut the hearing off. Amen? Uh, but the Lord, the Lord heals this man's ear and touches his ear. He wants to make sure that this man can hear the Word of God. He, he wants to make sure that this man can hear the good things of God. Now, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Lord healed this man's ear. And then he goes back to his prayer. This is going to be the last night before Calvary. And right before Calvary, his disciples begin to get sleepy and tired. And I thank the Lord that the work of God doesn't depend on you and I. Amen? Now you say, what do you mean? It does depend on us at some extent, preacher. Well, it does. But without God, as was quoted this morning, we can do nothing. And it's up to the Lord to do something. I, you know, if God doesn't change the hearts and minds of men and women, uh, we are never going to. But I know what we are to do. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're to continue in the things of God. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's good to be in God's house, amen. It's good to be in Sunday school. It's good to be in church, amen. It's a good thing. And God wants you and I to continue moving forward uh, in the good things of the Lord, no matter how bad it gets. I was looking just uh, the other day of a missionary in Africa. And uh, we would have a good crowd compared to his crowd. And he's on another side of the world and uh, sacrificed his life to go and preach to a people a lot that reject the Lord at times. The Lord here is in the garden. And while he sees for the first time, he is going to be separated from God the Father because sin is laid upon him. He's going to be betrayed by those that love him. And now I know the other disciples didn't betray him, but they all do flee. But as they're seeing this 
countenance of the Lord. Now, I believe personally the Lord's countenance changed dramatically when the sin of the world was placed upon him, and I personally believe it was in Gethsemane. He said, if this cup, this cup can pass from me, nevertheless not my will but thine, I believe he's talking about the cup of sin there. He's not talking about the cup of death. He's talking about the cup of sin. Because the book of Isaiah tells us that the Lord set his face like a flint toward Calvary. Jesus was never afraid to die. He was never scared to die. Christ didn't want the sin laid upon him. Uh, and that's what he was praying. That if there's any other way that I could die for these people by not being tainted by sin, uh, would it be possible that there'd be another way? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And while he's praying, the disciples are not only of some have betrayed him, others have fallen asleep. He now has the sin of the world upon his shoulders. And all of a sudden, he looks up at one of the disciples after he had taken off uh, the high priest's servant here, Peter. Peter, is he, he, he don't want to see this no more. He don't want to see his Lord suffering. And the Lord calls out to him and he says, Could not I call twelve legions of angels? And my father would presently see that I had them. Now, that twelve legion of angels, is uh, 5,000 is a legion times twelve. And the Lord said, Could not I ask for more than 60,000 angels? And they would deliver me. Now you remember when we preached in the life of Hezekiah, we talked about the power of that one angel who destroyed 300 and something thousand men uh, with one move. And Jesus is saying, I could call 60,000 or more angels in a second and they would be there. Now I don't know about you, but think about that. Here you are in the Garden of Gethsemane. One angel would have been enough but the Lord said, hey, look, let me bring into reality where you are. If I wanted 60,000 or more angels, they would be here now. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Now, what is he talking about? I personally believe he's talking about the scripture, the prophecy of Isaiah 53. Turn there, if you will, please. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah has come out and he's prophesied about what will take place. And here the Lord is, the suffering has begun. The sin has been laid upon the Lord Jesus in Gethsemane. And now the process of the punishment will begin. Now the Son of God being punished for the sins of the world. I want you to notice Isaiah had prophesied this. And what the Lord is saying is this. You can't stop this from happening because it's a must that the scriptures must be fulfilled. In other words, whatever heartache, Peter, whatever sorrow that you see coming in my life, it's got to take place. It must take place before the scriptures can be fulfilled. What is he talking about? Isaiah chapter 53, if you have your Bible, look with me there in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he openeth not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He is taken from prison and from judgment, and, and, and who shall declare his generation? Isaiah is prophesying. We're going to be preaching through this uh, right after the garden. He's going to Caiaphas. I'm going to try to preach between, if the Lord will allow me, from the garden to the cross in the next several weeks. But Isaiah says in verse 8, He is taken from prison and judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he shall be cut off of the land of the living. Uh, for the trans, watch it. He's going to be cut off. His life is going to come, is going to be lived short. Did you know they say 33 years is the prime age of a man? It's when a man is in his prime, when he really begins to be a man 
is around 33. And Isaiah had prophesied he's going to be cut off in the midst of his days. Notice the scriptures, verse 8. And he was taken from prison, from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. Watch it. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was... and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to shame, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see, watch this, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, uh, uh, by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, he shall bear their iniquities. He shall see, watch this, the travail of his soul. What is he talking about? In Gethsemane, friend, when the Lord had sin placed upon him, the eyes of Jehovah God was looking down and viewing what Christ was going through for mankind. That's what John meant when he said, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish. God viewed Jesus. His eyes saw the travail of his soul. Christ said this, I have got to suffer immensely before my Father that mankind may be saved. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. Here's what he's saying. By him suffering, by him being turned aside and left to die in Gethsemane, friend, Jesus was fulfilling God's will. Isaiah said he opened him, not his mouth. There in Gethsemane, friend, when they came to him and uh, they literally took him, how, let me ask you this, how do you take the prince of heaven, friend? How do you bond, bind, if you will, the prince of heaven? Here, the one who had power to bring and call 60,000 angels contained and, and if you will, held that, harnessed that power. You know why? Because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. And the scriptures said that he would die in immense pain and suffering for you and I. He would go to Calvary. Gethsemane was the path to Calvary. He had to go there and suffer the sorrow. What was the sorrow there, preacher? God had placed that sin upon Jesus. And because of that, Jehovah God would turn his face from answering the prayer of the Lord. He goes to Calvary in Gethsemane. Have you ever thought about this? The Lord, all he had to do is call upon those angels to take him and he said he could call more than 60,000 angels. How much power is that? I mean, when you think about that, have you thought about that? 60,000 angels descending down to the Son of God. And what he was trying to get Peter to see is this. Put your sword up. Don't defend me. Don't try to stop the perfect will of God. The scriptures must be fulfilled. I must suffer. Now, I want you to see a thought here. There was those that were willing to keep Jesus from dying. And the Lord had to educate them and help them see. I'm, it's a must that I suffer. It's a must that I, that I am abused. It's a must that I carry this sorrow. Now, think about this. I am exceeding sorrowful even unto death. And he began to be very heavy. Here's what he's saying. The sin of the world that was placed upon Jesus. 
You think of all the wickedness and the ungodly sin that could ever be committed was placed on the innocent head of the Son of God. When that happened, watch this, he began to sweat great drops of blood. I'm telling you, that sin penetrated his body and the blood began to be spilled. What do you mean, preacher? Listen to me. There's life in the blood. If you lose so much blood, you'll die and I'll die. The minute sin touched his body, the death process started. He began to bleed because of sin. I want to remind you today, heaven's prince bled because of your sin and my sin. It was my sin that he took upon him in Gethsemane. It was my sin that made him sorrowful. It was my sin that was very heavy. It was my iniquities. It was mine. And, the, and Isaiah said, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. The entire weight of the world's sin was placed upon him. And he did it willingly. Matter of fact, the disciples, a few of them tried to stop it. Peter said, they're not going mistre- to mistreat my Lord. They're not going to mistreat Jesus. And when they came to take him, he took that sword off and was going to defend the Lord. And you know what the Lord did? The Lord publicly corrected him. And said, look, it's a must. This has to happen for the scriptures to be fulfilled. Now look here. God is so sovereign and so perfect. The Lord wrote every bit of this before it ever took place. Isaiah prophesied it. The Bible is filled with prophecies about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. And there in that garden, Jesus, watch it, when some tried to spare his life, Christ was obedient to the word of God. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Even to the point of where he didn't want sin, sin was on him. His disciples were trying to stop the process of agony and the brutality that was coming. And the Lord would not allow them to do it because he must suffer. And so rather than calling 60 plus thousand angels... He said, my father has developed this plan. What you can't understand, Peter, is this. Put your sword up. When you reached for your sword, Peter was reaching for a way of a vengeance to avenge that which was wrong. And Peter was trying to take up for the Lord and stop the cruel death that was coming to the Lord. But the Lord was sending Peter this message I must be mistreated. I must be abused. I must be beaten and mocked and ridiculed where you don't have to be, Peter. And what you see here is this. The Lord refusing rescue from heaven and from earth that he might die in my place. The substitutionary death of Christ You don't, hey, let me ask you a question. You don't think that Gabriel and Michael and those 60,000 celestial beings were on the edge of the realm of heaven to stop the brutality and the wickedness that would take place in the life of the Son of God? But he refused it. He said, no, it must be 
I must die that you may live. Did you know this? Life is running out, friend. Time is like a vapor. It's here and gone. <laughs> and it won't be long. The blood will quit flowing through the body. The eyes will roll back and the blueness of death will come upon our bodies. And death will reign again in this earth. But my spiritual death, my spiritual body, my soul, my spirit, Christ died that I might not ever see the second death. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. He refused the help of the angels and the help of his disciples. He wanted, he voluntarily was willing to be mistreated. We'll see here in weeks by Caiaphas at the judgment hall of Caiaphas. You're going to see him voluntarily take upon the guilt and the shame. Uh, there's accusations made about him. And, and Caiaphas will ask him, is this, is this your sin? Did you do this? Are you guilty of this? Caius will ask him these words, What hast thou done? And Jesus will never defend himself. He'll never call for those angels. He'll not let the disciples stand up and preach to defend him. But he opens not his mouth, the prophet said. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the sorrow and the brokenness and the wickedness, every bit of it is laid on him at in Gethsemane for you and I. He said that the scriptures will be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. I couldn't get away from that passage. And here's what he means. And I'm going to close. God looks down on his creation, that's you and I. And I want you to think about the creation of God. What a marvelous creation. The brain, the eyes, the eyesight, the brain, the intelligence of the brain, the, the physical capability of the body, how you and I can, can accomplish great things in life. One day, we're going to die. It's all going to be over with. And Jehovah God looked down after we had sinned. How will I ever keep man from dying and going to a place where there must be a punishment where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched? And so God sent Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not be robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, watch it, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. And while he's there, the earthly Loved ones and disciples were trying to spare his life. He brought into their mindset, don't you realize right now that I could presently beckon 60,000 plus angels that would descend on my behalf. You remember when they appeared before, you remember me preaching on the Roman soldiers and how they come out and they go and they went in a circle around, around. You remember that message? I could imagine all those angels just falling, bam, 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 around the Lord in protection. And no one would have ever been able to accuse him. No one would have ever been able to accuse him or to whip him they would have never listened to this. With all those angels around our Lord, no one would have never spit in his face. They would have never took out the cat of nine tails. They would have never stripped him naked. 
They would have never mocked him and beat him. But he said, the scriptures must be fulfilled. I must die. I must go to Calvary. I must die and suffer. And guess who it was for? It was for you. And for you, and for you, and for you, and 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 me. No man has ever loved you like our Lord. No one has ever begun to illustrate or to distribute the kind of love that Jesus did in Gethsemane. Oh, how he loves you today. How he loves me. The Lord laid down his life for me and you. And he did it. Watch how he did it in obedience to the scriptures. There's a double love here. There's a love for mankind's soul to cleanse us and, and from all unrighteousness by his shed blood. And there's an undying love for the word of God in his heart. And both of those motivated him. To willfully suffer for you and I. Stand with me if you would. I want to ask you this morning while she comes. We'll have her play just something softly. Maybe you need to slip out and say, Lord, oh how you love him today. Maybe you just need to get around him just for a minute or two in prayer somewhere. Oh yeah, listen to it. Mm -hmm. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. What a song. What a Lord. I don't know if you're watching this morning on Facebook. And I want to remind you, friend, God loves you. God loves His people to the extent that he refused the help of angelic help. He refused angelic help and he refused the help of mankind to save my wretched soul and to obey the perfect word of God. What a Savior, what a Lord, what a God. I love him today. Let me remind you on the way out, you can give your tithe and offering. The fellows will be at the back. We'll let them be, make their way back there. It's been good to be in God's house. And I hope and pray you'll be able to be back tonight. We'll be back in the life of David. And uh, Lord willing, we'll have some more here. But hey, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Don't forget next Sunday night now, uh, the third Sunday night fellowship, I think it's taco night. If tacos won't bring them in, bless God, they're not coming never. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Thank you so much for your goodness. Use the word of God in our lives throughout this day. Bring us back this evening, and I promise you for all you do, for everything you'll accomplish, we'll love you for it. In the sweetest name that's ever slipped to the lips of mankind, in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.